All right. Uh, so we're, we're still answering question number 21. May a person be saved apart from repentance and the life mentioned in 15, 1 through 4. Why or why not? Um, uh, let's see. Let's finish what we're reading. As uh, every man is bound to make private confession of his sins to God, praying for the pardon of the rev upon which and the forsaking of which uh, in duty they are bound to do, Five, we cannot by our best works merit pardon for sin or eternal life. Or eternal life uh, at the hand of God by reason of the great disproportion that is between them and the glory to come and the infinite distance that is between us and God. Uh, whom Please, by... Excuse me, page, I think. Yeah, it's gone on to good works, hasn't it? <laughs> that's, why I would, that's why I looked back at it. Um, all right. So, as every man is bound to make confession of his sins to God, praying for the pardon thereof, upon which and the forsaking of them he shall find service, uh, mercy. So, he that scandaleth, scandalizeth his brother or the church of Christ ought to be willing by private or public confession and sorrow for his sin to declare his repentance to those that are offended who are thereupon to be reconciled to him and in love to receive him. Uh, okay, so can a person be uh, saved apart from repentance unto life? Well, the answer to the confession is no, you cannot be saved. The repentance and faith are two sides of the same gospel coin. And as we you know, pretty much discussed already, uh, it's, uh, it's <coughs> described as an evangelical grace that is alongside of faith. Um, uh, 15.3 said of such necessity to all sinners that none may expect pardon without it. And you can see this in the preaching of the apostles and Jesus. I mean, go, go, go to the very first Christian sermon ever. And uh, the crowd says, what shall we do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. He doesn't even say believe. He says repent. And then when you go through the book of Acts, they're almost used interchangeably. Sometimes they'll say repent. Sometimes they'll say repent. Uh, Believe. Sometimes it'll be believe and repent. Both will be named, but they're they're they're. Um, I think I think the the right understanding is that they are the two sides of the same act: the turning away from and to. Uh, so, can you be saved apart from repentance? No. Now, uh, the dispensationalists, uh, classic dispensationalism, had a huge argument with John MacArthur and his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, where they insisted. That repentance was to uh, say that repentance was necessary was to add a work to salvation, that it's faith alone, and even defining faith as just assent to doctrines. Now, almost a Roman Catholic uh, definition. You just believe. And no repentance or change of life required at all because that was viewed as works. Um, interestingly, in the book, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, that point of view has been all but universally repudiated, even by people who identify as uh, dispensationalists. So the counterattack by people like MacArthur and others on the inside of uh, dispensational churches and se uh, Dallas Seminary and so forth, they, the, other, the other side, represented by Louis Berry Schaefer, the theologian of dispensationalism, represented by Dwight Pentecost, by uh, Charles Ryrie the, uh, and Zane Hodges, these were the big names in dispensationalism uh, when I was coming along in the 1960s. And, um, and I, I studied at Hal Lindsey's school. Did I tell you all that? I told you that already, huh? Or did I? You guys heard that one? Yeah, White Powerhouse. Yeah, that's it. So you have heard this. So I, I studied at his school, and so I was in the thick of all that, the throes of it. And it, it but the part that never, never seemed right to me was the this whole idea of you could just believe and not repent. I just. It just doesn't make any sense biblically at all. Of course you have to repent. You repent from your sins. You're getting saved from your sins. What do you think you're getting saved from if it's not from your sins? Yes? So would, would it be a statement of repentance, I guess, when the thief on the cross says to the other thief, we got what we deserve? Yeah. yeah, there's a repentant attitude, spirit, outlook by the thief on the cross. Yeah, uh, he rebukes the other guy, right? Yeah. We're getting what we are due. He's innocent. 
And uh, so he shows enough insight, enough faith, and enough repentance there that Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Um, so the next question, 22, the confession underlines particular confession and public confession. Why? So, the, so we've read those sections. Here's what I want to suggest to you is, is at work in the confession. That is the circle, the circle of knowledge is as wide as the circle of confession. The circle of confession is as wide as the circle of knowledge. In other words, they are coextensive. So if I have sinned against my wife, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get up in the pulpit Sunday morning and say, Emily, look, I'm so sorry. I screamed at you yesterday and called you and then started talking you know, dirty words I used and all this. No. If I sin against my wife, I confess to my wife. It doesn't go any further than that. If, um, if I sin against a group or in a group meeting and um, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of bad behavior, I would go back to the group and I would confess my sins to the group. If I've sinned in the fa context of the family, I would confess my sin to the family. If I sin and it's public, then the confession of necessity then is public as well. So that's where, where church discipline will come to bear. So Matthew 18, Jesus says, you, you know, you're, you're you sin against uh, your, your brother or sin against you, 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 go to, you go to the individual and you confess. They won't agree, then, then, it, then it grows. You know, they, don't, they don't confess, they don't repent, then, then, it, then it goes from being private to public. But initially, the confession should be, the confession should be as broad as the knowledge. So if, say if one of our members, uh, again, gets the DUI and his, his picture is in the paper, well then that's a public confession. It would have to come to the session. Public confession it means that it's got to be dealt with in a, in, a, in, a, in a public way. And how you define that exactly, I don't know. At least it means you would come to the session and you would confess your sin and you would be admonished. So when we look at discipline, there's admonition, suspension from the sacraments and excommunication. So if, a, if, a, if there's a, of course, this isn't you know, every sin. This is a public, notorious sin that's being committed. It's out there in the public, then it, got, it has to be dealt with publicly. Uh, so that, that's really what the confession is, is getting at in the, the last paragraph uh, where it's talking about, uh, um, you know, to, your, to make private confession of your sins to God. If it's private, it's happening up here. I don't take that, I don't drag that up into the pulpit or to my small group Bible study or stand up on a Sunday night during announcements and say, look, this last week I sinned in my mind. I was thinking, you know, no. Um, private, personal sins, you, 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 you pers it's a personal confession to God. Private sins, it's to the person that has been offended. Group sins to the group. Public sins to the public. Yes? Um, we, we've heard reports of, and this happened at Asbury some many years ago when we were in college, but recently at Wheaton and Asbury, where students would get up in a chapel meeting and confess their sins in front of the whole group. Would that be something that we, if we were leading that meeting, say this is not the place for that? Squelch that kind of a confession? I'm just curious when we talk about private. It seems like it, it would open our door to a lot of trouble. If we yeah, I, I, I think the whole line is being pretty clearly drawn here with Terry saying, between sins that, you know, we sin every day in thought we're in need, right? So if we were to pile all of that into a public confession, that would be impractical. We, we have a certain degree of work on one side of the line where we keep these between God and us, and it, it wouldn't work on the outside. It, you know, there's a line to be drawn there. I think that, um, I think the specificity would be out of order. Yeah. I think to say, look, I've been a hypocrite. I've been pretending to be one thing and I've been living an entirely different life privately. But then to go into the gruesome details uh, and the lurid details, it's a, there's a kind of an exhibitionism that I think should be discouraged. So we don't need to know your details. As a matter of fact, it's horrible to yeah. us to know the details. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you remember campus meetings where that would break out. Yes. And so a beautiful co-ed girl would stand up and confess her sins. And to the downfall of every young man who's sitting in there listening to yes, well, you know, yeah. Well, I, I remember coming home from a Campus Crusade um, conference. I think it was Campus Crusade. And the 
two guy, older guys that I looked up to, and they really had an important impact on me as a young, growing Christian, college Christian. They started talking about the temptations that they had faced in life and went into graphic detail about it. And I'm kind of a little innocent me sitting in the back seat, and I'm just going, wow, you know, oh, my goodness. Um, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was, that was not helpful to me as a young Christian to hear all that. I, sh I shouldn't have heard that. It was, it was virtually pornographic. Um, so, no, it, in general, uh, that I, I'm, you know, I'm very, very tempted. I've been a hypocrite. I've, I've uh, you know, I, I don't think we need to be specific except where the sin is specific. And then, and then I, I think the Bible itself is very instructive about this. David's sin with Bathsheba. Contrast that with the way adultery is portrayed in your, in your typ typical ca cable TV show. So it's a very understated, right? Very, very understated. Um, no, nothing graphic about it at all. And that's the way sin is treated in the Bible. It doesn't stir up the imagination. Um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's understated. It's, um, it's, a fa it's, you know, just factual. It's just factual. And, and instead, it, instead of it being um, g given details that are um, erotic in nature, that uh, have the capacity to stir up lust, for others to fantasize, to visualize. Um, okay, your confet, your yeah. I think you don't want to you don't you don't want to create mental pictures for people. For people. So I would discourage it. Aside from generalizations. So yeah. knowledge there would be knowledge of the offense. Uh, those within the knowledge of the offense. You know of the offense. You sin against your wife, you confess to your wife. Sin against the family, you confess to the family. So the, as, as wide as the knowledge of the offense is, that's how wide the confession should be. So that's why at times we as a church have required that people get in front of the church and confess their sin. It hasn't happened very often, but it has happened because it was a public sin. And so it needed to be dealt with in a public way. Yes? Is this part of the reason why gossip can be such a harmful thing? Uh, where, like, if I sinned against this group, I uh, confess in front of this group, but then um, someone kind of leaked it out into the general, where it's like, I've already dealt with it, I've already confessed, it should be done, it should be resolved, and yet it's still circulating. Yes, yes, but you know, I think that you're right, identifying a danger, but, but the other side of it is, w w uh, thinking back to one specific occasion, when um, fellow got his girlfriend pregnant, there was no way to avoid that, it was very public. So we required public confession. Uh, what was interesting about all that was it completely shut down the gossip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It not only shut it down, but then as soon as all that was done, it was after a more, an, an evening worship service, it was like the congregation just swarmed around them, offering their help, offering their love, offering their, their um, care. And uh, that, that, that couple has come back to me years later and said that was the turning point in their Christian lives. Yeah. He, he, that, he went on and served as a deacon. Yes. She, she was very active in the life of the church. Yeah. And typically, um, when that's done, um, a statement is made that th that should end all, there's, right. should end all the discussion and gossip regarding this. Yeah. It, it lays it to rest. And, and it, what should I'm sure it doesn't shut it all down, but it really did. And, it, you know, there's been a more recent occasion of this, and it, shut, it pretty much shut that down. Nobody's saying, you know, whisper. Oh, what? Yeah, and the danger is if it's not dealt with publicly, then the gossip will be rampant. So right. It will yeah. it can take off. So get it out there. Get it out there. Deal with it, and it's over. And then everybody just feels free. They don't have to whisper about it and talk about it, and who knows, and when did it? No, that all gets shut down, and everybody just loves them. Ideally. Okay. Um, 23. Uh, what are good works and what part do they play in our salvation? 
So let's read. Good works are only such as God hath commanded in his holy word, and not such, such as are without warrant thereof as devised by men out of, out of blind zeal or upon any pretense of good intention. So uh, let's say that somebody said, all right, what's that? Well, that's really, let's t talk about what it's addressing at first. That's addressing monasticism. Vow of obedience to a human authority, the head of the, of the, of the monastic order, of celibacy, and of poverty. Has God asked you to vow poverty or celibacy? No. Um, do, you have the, do many men enter into monasteries who don't have the capacity for celibacy? Yes. Um, the confession and Protestantism has been very opposed to that, that it has led to much sin for many, many people uh, because you are requiring people to do what God does not require of him. So we had a problem with that here with, uh, to be frank about it, when uh, Dr. Charles Woodbridge was the pastor here, 1945 to 1950, and six months before he got out of town, he, he uh, organized a congregational meeting which lasted from noon until five in the afternoon in which he convinced the congregation to require that all officers of the church um, pledge uh, to abstain from alcoholic beverages. Okay, that's an extra biblical requirement. God does not require abstention from us. He requires moderation. You get drunk, it's a sin. You drink moderately, it's, it's permitted. It's a Christian liberty. You don't want to drink, don't drink. You want to drink, drink. But you have to drink in moderation, can't drink. No, they decided that it would be a test of office, that you must abstain from alcoholic beverages. I think that's forbidden by this, by this article. This is not something that God commands. This is something that human beings have, have, uh, have, have made up just as sure as, as, as were the monastic vows. Not, God, God has not asked, asked this, and instead it's being criticized here as, a, as something devised by men out of blind zeal. So what do I mean by blind zeal? What if I say, I am so devoted to God that I'm going to cut off my right hand? Because Jesus said you cut off your right hand if it causes you to sin and you pluck out your eye. Does God, should we understand Jesus' words to mean that, that that's what God requires of us? Now that would be blind zeal, right? That'd be ignorant zeal. Yeah, you've got zeal. I mean, you have to have a lot of zeal to chop off your hand and pluck out your eye, but is that, is that what that means? We don't think so. That's a bit of hyperbole. It's, that's how seriously you're to take your sin. That, uh, that, if, that if there is something in this world that leads you to sin, you need to flee from it. You need to get away from it. All right? And if that means you chop off your hand and pluck out your eye, that's, uh, that's the degree, the seriousness with which you're to take this. But not literally do that. To, you, you would be... Um, yeah, you might have good intentions, but that, this is blind zeal, and it's a human requirement. It's not a divine requirement. All right. Yeah, well, in that, I think that, that we can define, well, that really, that's the next category. We can define good works as something other than what God commands. So a lot of virtue signaling right now in our society has nothing to do with what God commands. It has everything to do with societal expectations that have been created by various interest groups. And chasing after those things <clears throat> makes it a lot easier for us, for us to ignore our own particular sins. No. The things that God does command us. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to deal with those. I'm going to go after yeah. my righteousness here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, you know, you can see the promoting of of good works, uh, particularly having to do with the sins of previous generations, which were very hard. Were very harsh with those sins. Uh, colonialism. We can just beat up on the colonialists, you know, all day long. Well, we're not tempted by that sin. That's not really a sin that, you know, characterizes our age. You know, and C.S. Lewis points this out. We are very, very tough on previous generations. We're utterly blind to what we're, we're doing. So we like the virtue signal. Look at my good works. I mean, I'm condemning, uh, you know, the evils of colonialism. I'm um, c condemning, uh, you know, racial, ethnic, class bias. I'm, I'm, I'm condemning uh, people who pollute the environment. 
you know, you know, we have our list, and those are our good works. Um, and some of them, you, you could argue they are God's good works. They are good works according to what the Bible would say, but uh, uh, others of them are, are, are beyond that. And they're not, and what the confession wants us to do is to define good works by Scripture. Good works are works that God calls good. Uh, Warren? What would you say to those who say they're doing a good work by abstaining from a very great sin they're tempted by? You're yeah. resisting temptation, therefore. I think that's Christian liberty. And I think it's, 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 it's a wisdom issue. You know, it's, uh, this is the Proverbs. You know, you know the prostitute lives. The adulteress lives down that road. Don't go down that road. So are you required to abstain from walking down that road? Is there some Bible <laughs> verse that says don't? No. But is it a wisdom issue? Whereas you know if you go down that road, you're going to get seduced, so you better not go down that road. You would yield the, surrender the liberty to go down the road in order to avoid the sin. Or, or, you, would, that, or, or you could even define it as an exercise of Christian liberty. I have the liberty not to go down that road. I have the liberty, I'm an abstainer from alcohol. I have the liberty not to drink. I choose not to drink. Somebody else might choose not to eat meat. This is Romans 14. You have the freedom to do what you want to do. Within the, within the parameters of God's law. So you can, you can, you can, you can imbibe, you can abstain. Um, so b back to 67. Got these all stapled wrong, so I've got to hunt, hunt around for it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so it's, really, it's really at the top here. Good works are only such as God hath commanded in his holy word. Not something that we make up, not self-mutilation, not self-flagellation, not vows of poverty, uh, celibacy, and obedience. Good works are defined as God defines good. Okay, these good works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruit and evidences of a true and lively faith. So, 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 so good works are, are what flow out of saving faith. They, they are not meritorious. So there's a sense in which it is proper to say they are necessary but not meritorious. That's what we want to say. Necessary because they inevitably flow out of saving faith. A redeemed life, the regenerate, those who are saved, they inevitably and invariably, they do good works. So they are necessary. It's necessary that good works result from a truly converted person, but they are not meritorious. Um, and by them, believers manifest their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren, adorn the profession of the gospel, stop the mouths of the adversaries, and glorify God, whose workmanship they are created in Christ Jesus thereunto, that having their fruit unto holiness, they may have the end eternal life. Um, third paragraph, their ability to do good works is not at all of themselves, but wholly of the Spirit of Christ and that they may be enabled thereunto. Besides the grace they have already received, there is required an actual influence of the same Holy Spirit. So what does it take to do good works? Well, it takes the grace of God. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to work in them, to will and to do of His good pleasure, which is Philippians 2.13. Yet they are not... Here, uh, hereby to grow negligent as if they were not bound to perform any duty unless upon a special motion of the Spirit. So I can't say, well, you know, the, the Holy Spirit hasn't moved me to do the good thing that I should do. I see that it's commanded. I, think, I see that it's required. But I, I'm not going to do that because I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to prompt me. But again, as you've said, you don't separate the Spirit from the Word. They are, yes. they are hand in hand. They, mm -hmm. Yes, and, and people, people will say things like, well, until I have the proper motive, and I, I shouldn't try to do the thing because that would just be hypocrisy. No, 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 no. You do the right thing. You wait for the emotions to catch up. Um, um, you, you're not waiting for the, you know, the Spirit to in, intervene and, and change your motives and prompt your actions. You see what God says, and, and you, you go about um, obeying that and, and wait for your, your affections to catch up. So that, uh, so no, you don't wait for a special motion of the Spirit 
uh, but they ought to be diligent in stirring up the grace of God that is in them by, by faith proceeding, moving ahead and doing what's right. They who in their obedience attain to the greatest height which is possible in this life are so far from being able to super arrogate. All right, so what is super arrogate? Arrogate is to pay out or expend. Super is over and above. So good works that are over and above the ordinary, what God normally requires. And so the idea here is that the saints are people who have these, these uh, merits of super arrogation that they, that they were like able to accumulate for themselves, which go into the treasury of saints, which you are able to tap on by paying indulgences and and, and so forth. And so the confession is going to deny that altogether. There are no works of super arrogation over and above the ordinary that are meritorious. So it's the, the rebuttal is, they who in their obedience attain to, to the greatest height which is possible in this life so uh, are so far be, uh, from being able to super arrogate and to do more than God requires that is to say, none of us ever does more than God requires. No, instead, as, they, as that they fall short of much. Now let me go on a hunt for page 71. There it is. Which in duty they are bound to do. Uh, paragraph 5, we cannot do our best. We cannot by our best works merit pardon of sin or eternal life at the hand of God by reason of the great disproportion that is between them and the glory to come and the infinite distance that is between us and God whom by them we can neither profit nor satisfy for the debt of our former sin. But, great citation at the end of paragraph 5, when we have done all, we can, we have done but our duty and our unprofitable servants. That is taken from Luke 17, 10. And because as they are good, they proceed from his spirit, and as they are wrought by us, they are defiled and mixed with so much weakness and imperfection that they cannot endure the severity of God's judgment. At our best. Notwithstanding the persons of believers being accepted through Christ, their good works also are accepted in him, not as though they were in this life wholly unblameable and unreprovable in God's sight, but that he, looking upon them in his Son, is pleased to accept and reward that which is sincere, though accompanied with many weaknesses and imperfections. It's a beautiful thing. All right, so here's, here's, what is, uh, here's a summary for question number 23. What are good works? They must be... Here's the characteristics of them. They're commanded only. Only things that are commanded. Second, they are necessary. They're necessary. They are the invariable fruit of faith. Third, they are spirit enabled. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Fruit of the spirit. They are flawed. Our best works are flawed. They fall short. They are tainted. Uh, five, accepted, though they're imperfect. I have um, discovered and found some support in the older writers for the concept of relative righteousness. Uh, officers are to be above reproach. Is there any man alive who has ever been above reproach? No. So what's that mean? Well, we can distinguish between those who are not above reproach, who are reproachable, and those who are above reproach. We can, we can make a distinction, and there's a meaningful distinction. So you can be above, above reproach, though imperfectly above reproach. So, so believers can be righteous, though they're imperfectly righteous. And I'll try to give you some examples of this. Six, uh, the, our good works are non-meritorious. Yeah, there we go. Non-meritorious. Uh, let's see. So, uh, could, could we say that missing one of those would, would mean that it is not a good work if it were commanded and necessary but not spirit and it would not be considered a good work? Uh, I, I mean, I'm regenerating. Yeah. 
yeah, 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 well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we could do, so we would make another distinction. All right, are the good works of the unregenerate good, not as God sees good? So we can distinguish between the form of a good work, the the, the Boy Scout leading the little little lady across the road, proverbial example. It, the form of that is good. That is a good thing he does. However, uh, the Apostle Paul says, whatever is not of faith is sin. Does he do it out of faith? No, he's a little pagan, but he's doing a good thing. The form of it was good, but the motive wasn't right. Uh, so, so, um, so, no, no. Um, it depends on what you mean by good. So that, that means that we can genuinely appreciate the good things that pagans do and call the good things good, even though we know they're not good as God sees good. Do you find Boy Scouts to tell them that they're pagans? <laughs> to, to, today, yeah. Well, you don't know. You could be a little Christian Boy Scouts. Yeah. Yeah. I'm reminded there's no Boy Scouts anymore. There are. They're just Scouts. Yeah. Pagans. Okay, so 24, what are the respective contributions of God and man in good works? And 25, uh, how does God view our good works and why does he receive them? So, so let's deal with 24 just um, by looking at a number of verses that I, that I hope will help. So l l l look at the way these things are kept in tension. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So are they God's works or our works? Well, it's both, isn't it? So, God, uh, you know... His workmanship created. God prepared them, but who does the walking? We do. We work because God enables us to work. What are the contributions of each? We work, we're incapable of the work if God should not enable us to work. But because He works in us, we are able then to do the good things that He, that he requires of us. Um, Romans 6, uh, 22, You have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. So there is this liberation that has taken place um, so that we are able then to bear fruit for God because of what God has done. The, through Christ and the gospel has set us free from sin. We have become slaves to God, and so then we're able to bear this fruit that, are, that is evidence of sanctification and eternal life. Or better yet, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. There, there you see the picture of total dependence. What am I capable? Am I capable of doing any good thing, any good works, apart from the true vine? And the answer is no. I have no life in myself. I have no capacity in myself to do anything good of which God approves. So apart from Christ, I can do no good thing. My life is a, just a total exercise in futility when it comes to that. Here's, here's a great one. Um, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but uh, much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So there, it sounds like it's all up to you. For God, who works in you to will and to act. For, for it is God who works in you. Why are you able to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Because it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good pleasure. So because God works, we're able to work. We can't, we don't have, we're not able to, to work those good works on our own, in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own innate capacities. No, we can't do that. Uh, Jude, uh, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves, um, you know, you're praying, praying in, the Holy, in the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, it's presumably because you, you're lacking the power, the energy, the, the will to do what needs to be done. So as you're praying, then you, however, have the responsibility to keep yourself. And, and, and notice the responsibility is being assigned to us to keep ourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy and so forth. Um, then as the necessity of good works, someone will say, you have faith, this is James 2, 18 and 22. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Why, why does it show faith? Because works are the fruit of faith. So where you see the good works, 
that are genuinely good, behind that is genuine faith. You see that faith was active. Along with his works, faith was being completed by his works. Faith works. Faith was active or working. 1 John 2, by this we've come to know him if we keep the commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. See how invariably and necessary the obedience and service and, and uh, good works are in the believer. They, they, they invariably and inevitably follow. You say, I've come to know him. Oh, yeah, I know God. Yeah, I know Christ. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. But doesn't keep the commandments. I mean, he's blunt. Yeah, that person's a liar. Because those who know him, if you know him, this is, you're going to, it's going to be characteristic. Does that mean perfectly? No, it means characteristically. Because nobody perfectly keeps the commandments, but, they're, but, but those who have been regenerated and saved and are disciples of Christ, they characteristically do keep the commandments. They live lives of, that are characterized by obedience and service and sacrificial love. If you don't keep the commandments, you're a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps in his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Uh, Jesus said, Matthew 7, you will know, recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. You can know the genuine thing. You can know the healthy thing. You can know the kind of uh, person that that person is by the fruit um, that emerges from their lives. Does, uh, you know, does, uh, uh, is, is there present the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit? That'd be a good place to start. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The fruit of holiness, the fruit of love, the, the fruit of service, the fruit of obedience. Are, are those evident in a person's life? Again, never perfectly, but characteristically. That's the meaning of the Greek present tense, by the way, in 1 John, where he's so emphatic and categorical. You know, the, more the what does he say? The, about the believer does not sin. Well, it means characteristically. That's not the pattern of life for them. Of course they sin, but they're not characteristically. Um, uh, Matthew 5, 16. I've heard you say, I think maybe you've been in here a few weeks back, you can sin and you can do the sin. You can be a, uh, you can, you can steal. Uh, but then at a certain point, you, you become a thief. Yeah, I think we talked about this when we looked at the chapter on sin, that sin changes people, right? So there's a difference between a person who is stolen and a person who's a thief, right? A person who is stolen has sinned. A person who is a thief characteristically steals. And there's a difference between that. Do, do Christians sometimes, uh, you know, does a, a you know a little angelic, obedient, sweet-spirited little Christian sometimes cheat on a test? Yeah. And when they're caught, do they weep and cry and mourn? And yes. Um, however, if they're a real Christian, they're going to not do that characteristically. So they will have done it. Yeah, of course. We all stumble and fall and fail, but. Do they do it? Is, is this something that now they habitually do? If they do, then you've got a bigger problem. Then you've got a bigger issue. What's really going on? Would the same apply for adultery? Yes, it would. <coughs> to a what? Adultery. adultery. Yes. If you do it once, you're not an adulterer. But if you continue in it, you're an adulterer. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm, I'm driving at. So a person who commits adultery, and, and see, this is the way that sin changes us. That's how you go from being uh, an, somebody who's committed adultery to being an adulterer. Because you do it once and you're really repentant, you don't go back there again. You hate it you, so much, you so abhor what happened that you just never go back. However, um, you go from being an adult, uh, having committed adultery to being an adulterer because... You know, after all that guilt, you go back a second time. Then you don't feel as guilty. Then you go back a third time, and you feel less guilty. And pretty soon, you don't feel guilty at all. And now you're just doing it all the time. And so now you're an adulterer. 
It's characteristic. It's now become habitual behavior. So don't ask the question at which point. I think I still do, although I'm going to think about it some more, which is that I understand that, that you commit adultery because you are an adulterer. And you, you commit idolatry because you are an idolater. You steal because you are a thief. So I would, but then in Christ, you become a new creation. That's so I would tweak that. I, I see. I, I, yeah, I think that you can be somebody who abhors adultery, the the thought of it, and then fall. You know, the, you're overcome by this unexpected, unanticipated, violent temptation, and you succumb, and you hate it, and you abominate it, and you grieve it, and you never go back to it. However, I think there's another story with somebody who same exact circumstances. After a couple of weeks, the conscience simmers down, they go back, and then they go back, and then they go back. So it's one thing to commit adultery, it's another thing to become an adulterer. That's what I would think is a more accurate description. Yes? Not to go down another rabbit hole here, uh, but a more cultural example, how would you relate that to people in their homosexual sin? I think it's the same. So I, I think you mentioned this in your podcast, but, uh, PCA Church voted down the idea that a homosexual pastor who doesn't indulge in homosexuality um, is still a homosexual who cannot be who cannot pastor a church. So we're we're pushing back pretty hard against the idea of homosexual as identity. We're, we're, we want to keep it under the category of behavior, because when you be, begin to, uh, to call it an identity, then you then you're falling into the trap of saying, well, that's the way I was made. That's who I am. That's my identity, as opposed to that's what I do. And that's really kind of that's a modern idea. It goes back to Freud that this is who you are. It's innate. You were made that way. It's like a trait of guilt. Yes, and then the guilt guilt disappears. It's like any any of us could be prone to homosexual thoughts, for example. That doesn't make us that as an identity. Of course not. We hate it, abhor it, and and we flee from it. But it's still possible. Yeah. I think your point, Blake, too, goes back to when we think about drawing lines between someone who does the sin versus who is this, like the sinner of this category. Uh, part 4 on chapter 15 on repentance where it says, there's no sin so small it deserves damnation. There's no sin so great that it can bring damnation. Well, that's actually repent. Like, it almost doesn't matter where we draw the lines because where there is genuine faith and repentance, the greatest adulterer who's been years in that living in that sin is going to be transformed or generated. So I think we can kind of get in the weeds on that, and yeah. it's not really helpful. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, one can be rescued and delivered from any pattern of sin. It certainly becomes more difficult, uh, but one can be delivered from that, and that's happened, I mean, Augustine himself, all right? He, he had a very deep, that's why he prayed, Lord, deliver me, but not yet because he didn't want to give up the pleasures of the flesh. So you can fall pretty deep. Well, you can, as, as an unbeliever, you can be delivered out of it entirely. And I think as a believer, as, as we just read, uh, you can fall pretty hard and far into sin. And yet the Spirit of God will prevail and draw us back out of that. And of course, there's forgiveness and mercy for all of our sins. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Yeah? Um, in the same way that sin changes, you can obedience change you as well. I think so. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, you, habits of the heart. You establish these habits, these patterns. That sounds like the categories of sanctification versus like the searing of the conscience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I, I think that this is this is the value of disciplines. Part of part of the way I would want to answer that question is that. You know, you, you establish the discipline of reading your Bible and praying every morning. That has a transforming effect over time. Even when you don't feel like it, you're tired, you don't want to do it. Uh, you establish the discipline of being in church Sunday morning and Sunday night. It's a discipline. You just do it. Um, and you don't feel like it. You'd rather, you'd rather watch the football game. You'd ra you're tired. You'd rather just rest. You, no, you just do it. You just establish the discipline. As you do that, uh, God blesses that decision and you, you, um, you're under the means of grace, and the soul is fed, and it, it, it's transformative over time. 
you establish right habits and, and it ma makes an impact over time. So I think you're thinking of the Christian life as a marathon rather than a sprint. So that's, that's what's to keep in mind. This is long term. This is a battle that goes on for a lifetime. And so I need to establish the right disciplines uh, and habits that are going to undergird and strengthen me for, the, for, the, for a lifetime. Okay, um, uh, so it's the 24 that's really synergistic. You know, God works so that we're able to work and do the good works. Uh, he receives them uh, because they're done in the name of Christ. They're done in the name of Christ and they're done as he enables us to do them. Uh, and they're, they're not, no, they're not perfect. They are flawed. They're deeply flawed. But because they're done with sincerity and because, um, uh, because they are an expression of our uh, genuine faith, he receives them. Uh, how does God view the works of the unregenerate? Um, there must have been another paragraph that was seven, seven, hid, hid, hidden in the in the in the in the midst of all of my mis uh, typed pages, it's misstapled pages. So why don't I do this? Paragraph 7. Works done by unregenerate men, although they, for the matter, that's what I was saying about the form. Mm -hmm. Helping the, the poor older lady across the road, that's a good thing. For them may be the things which God commands, and of good use both to themselves and others, yet because they proceed not from an heart purified by faith, nor done in the right manner according to the word, nor right and the glory of God, they are therefore sinful and cannot please God and cannot make a man meet to receive grace from God, and yet the neglect of them is more sinful and more displeasing to God. Okay, perseverance. Evaluate the statement once. Is, I, I thought of Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. It says, We are also responsible to stir one another up mm -hmm. to love and good deeds. We should be. Encouraging each other in, in that. Hey, let's go. Do, go with me. Let's go do this. Or how can we help this person out? Okay. Um, evaluate the statement. Once saved, always saved. What makes the pers of the perseverance of the saints certain? Is it true that once saved, always saved? Yeah, it is. Uh, what makes the perseverance of the saint certain? If it's God that saves us, only He can undo that, and He's promised that He won't. Yeah, He preserves us. So there's a, keep in mind two words, perseverance and preservation. We are able to persevere because God preserves us. So they that uh, whom God hath accepted in the beloved, effectually called and sanctified by his spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. And how, how is this so? Paragraph 2, the perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immutability of God, of, of the decree of election. In other words, God is determined to have his people, and he's going to have them. They will persevere. So if regeneration is sanctification begun, perseverance is sanctification completed, and it will come to completion. Um, flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father, there it is, He will have us. He's determined. He set His love upon us. He will have us. Upon the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Christ, Jesus is praying for us. We are the beneficiaries of His intercession for the saints. So that, that ensures his prayers are effectual. The, his air, prayers are answered. The Father hears the prayers of the Son, and he's praying for us, and those, those prayers will be effective in preserving us. The abiding of the Spirit, yeah, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to give you the strength to persevere. Uh, and the seed of God within them, that is our regeneration, we are now not what we were, we are, we, are, we are a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. So all these things conspire together to make certain 
that the saints will persevere. They will not be lost. They cannot be lost. And the nature of the covenant of grace, uh, from all which arises also the certainty and infallibility thereof. So just as a couple of samples, uh, we are kept by the power of God. And then Jesus, I will give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So there you have the double wrapping of two omnipotent pair of hands, right? You have the God the Son and God the Father have wrapped up the saints, his, the, the, the disciples of Jesus, and they are absolutely secure and safe. No one's going to be able to pry open two pairs of omnipotent hands and steal our souls away. Uh, John 6, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. There we have the, you know, the definiteness again. There is, a, there, there, there is a people given by the Father to the Son, and of all that the Father gives, he's not losing them. They will not be lost. He will raise them up on the last day. Philippians 1, 6, I'm, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, he will bring it to completion. And the, the Romans 8 passage just waxes eloquent. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The love of God which is ours in Christ. And he goes through every possible conceivable and, 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 and the, n no, none of it. Um, yet, so perseverance, preservation. So we are preserved through perseverance. So the fact that we are preserved doesn't mean we uh, no longer have a responsibility uh, to exercise any effort or to, to guard our hearts and guard our souls and walk in the Spirit. No, the one who perseveres to the end will be saved, Jesus says. It's uh, to the one that conquers that the promises are given. If we endure, we will also reign with him. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and pers perseveres, being no hearer, uh, who forgets but a doer, he will be blessed in his doing. So there's, there's the promise that is absolutely sure, um, but then, then there's also the means, and the, me the means by which God preserves his people is by them persevering, not apart from their persevering. How far can the elect fall into sin? They can fall they can fall very far into sin. It's a, it's a terrible thing when it, when it happens, um, but it does happen. Nevertheless, they may, through the temptations of Satan and of the world and the prevalency of corruption remaining with them, you still have those dregs, the remnants of sin, of the sin nature, and the neglect of the means of their uh, preservation. So I, I'm talking to people regularly who are members of our church who never come. And I say, you're, you know, your soul is in peril. You're expecting that you're going to be able to thrive spiritually and morally, and you never come to church. You're not. You're at risk because you're neglecting the means by which you are preserved. So you're not under the ministry of the Word. You're not gathering with the saints. Jesus is present here, and you're not in fellowship with Him. Where he's present where two or more are gathered in his name. So you neglect the means of grace. Are you going to get in trouble? Probably. Yeah, I think you will. One way or another, emotionally, spiritually, you're going to, you're going to get into trouble. Morally. Um, so neglect of the means of their preservation, which is gathering with the people of God, the house of God, under the word of God, with the spirit of God. Um, and for a time continue therein, whereof they incur God's displeasure, grieve His Holy Spirit, come to be deprived of some measure of His graces and comforts, uh, have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and scandalize others, and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. Amen. All right, class dismissed.